Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last few lectures of EC 2026 Introduction to Signal Processing, we introduced finite impulse response filters and the system properties of linearity and time invariance. In this lecture, we'll use those ideas to motivate a mathematical operation called convolution. When we looked at FIR filters, we looked at three different representations of the filter. One representation was its impulse response H, where we wrote it in terms of delta functions, all shifted to be at different positions with different coefficients. Or we could just plot the values, and you could easily move back and forth between these different representations. Or you could just list the values. For the FIR filter, that would be these coefficients B sub K. But you could do similar things for any signal. Let's think about writing some generic signal X of N in terms of Dirac delta functions in different positions times coefficients. So in this particular example, X0 is 2, so I would have 2 here. X1 is 4, so I would have 4 here, and so on. Suppose we put this sequence X of N into a linear time invariant system with impulse response H of N. How might we think about the output? Well, suppose for a second we didn't have any of these stems here. We just had this stem at n equals 0 with a height of 2. Well, we know that if we put the unit impulse delta n into the system, we get the impulse response h of n out. By the scaling property of a linear system, we know that if we have a given input, that gives us a certain output. We know that if we scale the input by some value here, x0, two in this example, we scale the output by x0. Now, let's play the same game. Let's consider this stem here, and suppose I didn't have this one at n equals zero, and I didn't have these over here either. The same idea of scaling still applies. Now, by the property of time invariance, I know that if I shift a particular input, that corresponds to shifting the particular output by the same amount. And I can play the same game for n equals 2 here. Ignore this, ignore this. Look at what the output you would get if you just had a delta sitting here at 2. And I could do this for all of the rest. So I decomposed my input as a sum of simple delta functions. And now by the superposition property of a linear system, I can write my output as a sum of those individual outputs for each of those inputs. X could be a signal running off infinitely in either direction, so I'll write this as an infinite sum over K, and my output is a sum of impulse responses shifted to land at different points times the appropriate coefficients for the input values. This is a special case of a general mathematical operation called a convolution. We have a notation for it where we write x of n, asterisk h of n. Now there's a couple of things to watch out for. One is that the asterisk is often used in programming languages to indicate multiplication. This is not multiplication. It's this much more complicated thing. The other thing that's misleading about this notation is that convolution is an operation on an entire sequence x and an entire sequence h that gives you an entire sequence y. This notation may mislead you into thinking that if you wanted to find what y of 3 is, you would compute x of 3, get a number, compute h of 3, get a number, and then do something to those two numbers. A more elegant notation might be to do something like this. You could say x asterisk h, put parentheses around it to indicate that you're doing things to these entire sequences. Then once you get a sequence, you could say, oh, well, let's pick out the nth value in that sequence. But this notation does have some advantages, as you'll see later. And the DSP first and signal processing first textbooks by McClellan and Schaefer use it, so I'll stick with it. Now, an interesting thing about convolution is that it's commutative. So you can swap the role of h and x here. So I could put h here and x here and get the same thing. The swapped version has an interesting interpretation 
in the context of finite impulse response filters. Remember that for a finite impulse response filter, the impulse response values h of k corresponded to the filter coefficients b of k, and it's a finite impulse response filter. So k just goes from 0 to this value m, where m is the order of the filter. Now, I want to emphasize that this direct, nice, easy equivalence between the filter coefficients and the impulse response only applies for FIR filters. Later in the class, we'll look at infinite impulse response filters, where the idea of taking an input and convolving it with an impulse response still applies as a mathematical concept. But for IIR filters, the relationship between the filter coefficients and the impulse response is vastly more complicated. If you have some sequences you need to convolve, you can ask MATLAB to do it for you. But to make sure you understand convolution, it's helpful to work out a few examples by hand. Let's say you have an FIR filter with this impulse response. So our filter coefficients are 1, minus 1, 2, minus 1, 1. And we input a unit step function into that filter, and we want to figure out what comes out. We can use this convolution formula here. In this particular case, the filter order is 4, so it's a length 5 filter. And it's handy to organize your computation in terms of a table. So we've written x of n along this row and h of n along this row. And each of the remaining rows corresponds to one of the terms in this summation. So k equals 0 corresponds to this first row. So we take x of n, shift it over by 0 time units so it lands in the same spot, and we multiply it by h of 0. Now for the next row, we'll take x of n, which here happens to be u of n, shift it one unit to the right, and then we multiply it by h1, which here is minus 1. And then we keep increasing k. Each time we increment k, we move our x of n one time unit to the right, and we multiply it by the appropriate h of k. So we march all the way down through k equals 4, and then to get the final values of y, we sum along the columns. This 1 and minus 1 cancel, and this minus 1 and 1 cancel, and then I'm left with 2. And at this point, I notice I have the same pattern for the remaining columns. So my final calculation for the output y of n is 1, 0, 2, 1, and then an infinite number of repeating 2s. Now remember, convolution is commutative. So I should be able to get the same result by swapping the role of what I'm reading off the coefficients of to multiply by, and what I'm actually shifting as we move down the rows. In this version of the table, we'll shift h. So each time we move down a row, we're shifting h one time unit to the right. And now we're multiplying by x0, x1, etc. It just so happens that x0, x1, etc. are all 1, so each row looks the same, just shifted to the right. Now, when I sum along the rows, I wind up with 1 here, 0 here, 2 here, 1 here, 2 here. Now let's be careful. Remember the sequence x? Remember this input function x? Keeps going. It's a unit step function. So there's actually an infinite number of rows in this table. But now let's think about this example for n equals 4. So for n equals 4, if I think about what's happening in the convolution, the way this is written here, this n is 4. I've got 4 minus m is 4, which is equal to 0. So don't worry too much about this particular notation here in the sum. This is just noting that h only has non-zero values for h0 up to h capital M. We generally write this as minus infinity down here and infinity up here, and just recognize that a bunch of the h's are zero. But if we think about the way this is working, this winds up being copied here, and there's another version down here, but it also has a one down here, and so on and so on and so on. So you wind up adding up the same thing and getting this two, two, two repeated sequence. Here's another example. We're taking x of n, and shifting it one time unit to the right, moving down the rows. 
In the first row, we take x of n and multiply it by 3 to get 6, 12, 18, 12, 6. And to get the next row, we do the same thing except we multiply it by minus 1, et cetera, et cetera. And then summing along the columns here gives us our y of n. A good exercise would be to do this convolution the other way, where you shift this 3, minus 1, 2, 1 signal, multiplying it by 2, and then multiplying it by 4, and then multiplying it by 6 as you march along the rows. In that case, you would have five rows in the table instead of four, and when you sum along the columns, you should get the same sequence. There are plugins for digital audio workstation software that will take your music and convolve it with an impulse response. You can measure impulse responses of real acoustic spaces and make it sound like your music was recorded in that space through convolution. And guitar players can use impulse responses of certain speakers combined with certain microphones and try different impulse responses to make it sound like their guitar is being played through those speaker microphone combinations without actually having to set up any speakers or microphones at all in the real world. Before we close out, I would like to invite you to check out the first 12 minutes of my lecture for EC3084 titled, Why Are LTI Systems So Awesome? 3084 is about continuous time signals and systems, but in this lecture, I review discrete time convolution to set the stage. There is a concept of convolution for continuous time signals that involves integrals instead of sums, but we'll save that for EC3084.